Welcome to the Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. Now, if ever there was a power CV, it belongs to my guest today, Dr. Pippa Malmgren. From stints in the White House advising presidents on economic policy to her role at Whitehall working with international leaders on trade. What's more, she's the founder of a business that develops drones as tools, not toys. And it doesn't stop there. She's also the author of Signals, which lifts the lid on how to spot economic trends through everyday objects. Pippa. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hail to the chief, or wow. not. Last time I interviewed you, you were a big fan of the Donald. You're not so sure these days. What? Surely you're not flip-flopping. I said uh, I thought he would win. Ah. That's the... Not the, make a right. good president. Predictions and, and preferences are not exactly the same thing. Although I have to say, I am a Republican, so I'm in favor of a lot of his philosophy. But gosh, the delivery certainly leaves something to be desired, obviously. Yeah, so in, in your view, could, could you get any better? Or, or, is, or, or have we seen the best? Well, okay, here's the deal. You have to understand, the people who support him brought him in to basically burn Washington down, right? Oh. His whole goal is to disrupt, Fire and fury. disintermediate, completely render the town in a com different structure than ever before. So everything the media reports as a disaster is seen by his people as a success. A success, right. But, I mean, he's cut taxes. He's introduced trade tariffs, he's taken pot shots at Jeff Bezos. Mm. Is this a president that's good for business? It is good for business in the sense that it's the philosophy he represents well, the and lower taxes. Right? That's it's, well, they it's have a contributing been up and factor. Down, but I'm not going to give Molly credit for it, but it's a contributing factor. And they like the less regulatory red tape approach that he represents. And to be honest, even on the trade policy where he's taking an incredibly tough line, personally, I think that's much more to do with negotiating tactics around North Korea. In other words, everything is on the negotiating table, and that's one reason the markets aren't being too disrupted but by when it. When he takes a, a pot shot at Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, sort of raises questions about the tax that he's paying, certainly the fact that he's overusing the US Postal Service. Is that a politician making capital out of the fact that the reputation of business might be even worse than his? I think it's something quite different than that. Everybody knows Bezos has ambitions to run for the presidency. Right, so this is just saying our future is competition. Just, that's all this is. The next presidential campaign has begun. Right, I mean, you've talked about him being hostile to trade and that we can't magic up a trade deal with the UK. Does, it, does that still stand? You said that about a year ago. Well, still, I mean, to be clear, what I said is it's legally, it's, and in terms of the Constitution, it's not the president's authority. The authority resides in Congress. So on trade deals, you have to get Congress along right, for the so ride. You can't just do the deal with the president. And that's all I was saying for the British. You know, don't get too, um, too, too depressed about what the president is saying about trade. Congress is who we have to talk to. But is he good news for Britain, do you think? Has he, will, will he get, I mean, you worked with George W. Bush. Will, will he be better for Britain than, than say, a uh, more know, traditional president like George W.? Uh, it's hard to say. Here's what cl is clear. The only country that he wants to do a free trade deal with is the United Kingdom. So that can't be bad to have the UK more integrated with the fastest growing industrialized economy in the world. That, that can't be a bad thing for the United Kingdom, whether or not you like the president. The fact is the country is doing very well and its economy is doing very well. Its innovation is incredibly high. And Britain is the second most interesting place on the planet for investors as a result. Is he an Anglophile? Does he, does he like the UK, do you think? I don't know. I don't know him well enough, but <laughs> I suspect he is because of his own golf courses in I mean, he doesn't Scotland. Like the, he doesn't like the location of the new embassy. Off, uh, off well, center. you know I, what? It's interesting. It wasn't the location that he complained about. It was the terms of the deal. And he felt that the U.S. sold the old embassy too cheaply. Too cheap. Okay. And so, maybe there's an argument. So to is the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur in him feels he, he didn't get a good deal. He can't leave it behind. He's a property deal guy. And right. On every issue. This now, shows. I mean, just give us a sense. I mean, most of us, the closest we'll ever get is the West Wing, or we might watch the odd <laughs> edition of House of Cards. I mean, you worked. You served in the White House as an advisor on economic policy. Just give us yeah. a a brief sense of what that means in okay. terms of your career. Well, first of all, really simply, House of Cards has nothing on reality. Uh, it's much darker well, in real life. <laughs> in real life. So, well, House of Cards there. is just like a, a sort of, like a, a sort of loose, it's loose like documentary. It's like a nice version. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> Second of all, West Wing, everybody talks that fast. Aaron Sorkin, who wrote that, clearly spent a lot of time in the West Wing because the one thing you don't have is time. And you have to make decisions without sufficient time, sufficient information, and that have huge consequences. So the speed of West Wing is exactly what it's like right. in real life. And if you were to take out one life learning that you've learned from the years that you served there, in terms of something that you've brought out 
over to the UK perhaps into yeah. the White House experience. What might that be? Number one, if you can't explain your issue in one paragraph with three positive choices, I've had it. Then, <laughs> then you're, you can't you can't advise a head of government because that's what's required. Right. One paragraph. Okay. Well, you wrote a lot more than just a paragraph <laughs> because you wrote a book. You're about to write another one, but you wrote signals um, on the premise that everyday science can help us navigate the economy, navigate our lives. Give us an example of the sort of things that, that are around us that show us the signs of the sort of world we're living in. <laughs> well, so I just got frustrated because I kept seeing stuff coming like Brexit and Trump and the financial crisis and nobody else was seeing it. And I'm like, but, what am I uh, able... I, I, so here's my answer. My answer is if you look at the world through only one eye, which is a mathematical lens, and you think the answers are only in data, you're going to miss a whole lot right. of stuff. So the argument of the book was open your other eye and look for things that you can see in like real chocolate. life. Like chocolate. So chocolate. So when chocolate bars start to get smaller, but the price stays the same, this is telling you inflation is building up in the system, and I call it shrinkflation. Shrinkflation. It's a precursor, early indicator of inflation. If you want to talk so, about so populism... I, so, okay, so if one of our viewers is eating a chocolate bar now, they if, should be looking at it on the ground. And, and asking, They're getting is smaller. it smaller than it was before, and does it cost the same as I it mean, did? Thing. Uh, well, but the point is, if it was about your weight, it would cost the same in terms of weight, right? Pri same price per weight. But no, they keep the old price and give you less, which means it's not about your weight. It's about protecting the margin of the company. And here's another one, populism, right? What was the most popular clothing item at the top shop this last year? I so no this idea. is a Tell fashion me. signal. Right. Completely it... transparent jeans. And I mean completely. Tra completely right. see transparent, see-through clothing, jeans. So what does that tell us about? I the em think... empress, an empresses of their new clothes. And, and it's kind of a cry for transparency. Oh, wow. And, you know, so, it's a way of the so fashion I'm... community expressing their frustration with the establishment. And well, if you I, open your other eye to I that, didn't know that, you can really but... see populism. It's playing itself out in lots of ways. Okay, you, you wrote the book in 2016. Yeah. Since then, we've had Brexit, Which we've I had Donald Trump, we've had Jeremy Corbyn in this, in this country. You mentioned populism, wa waves of populism. Yeah. Did you spot any of these signals? I mean, yeah, I, it's yeah, always, yeah. I mean, you know, things are always easier in hindsight. No, no, no. That was part of the reason for, for, for writing it was because I could see populism lifting and happening and people were not ready for it. I could see Brexit was going to unfold and people were saying, it'll never happen. I'm like, it's definitely going to happen. But if you were looking then at what so it's happened in yeah. terms of the signals for what comes next now that we see Donald Trump in the White House, we see a Brexit leaving the European Union. Yeah. In terms of the signals for the next chapter of change, what should we be expecting? Well, I see a bunch of things. The biggest institutional investors in the world are saying, I might not like Brexit and its uncertainty, but I still can't make any money on the continent. It's still hard to make money in France or in Italy for all kinds of reasons. And so they look at the UK and say it still has a really high level of innovation. It totally leads in artificial intelligence. So they're putting as much okay. more money than ever right. before. So, so that's what organized capital, what yeah. the status quo is doing. But we've also seen this absolute tidal wave of volatility in sure. terms of voting preferences, in terms of old realities swept away, in terms of yeah. making sense of that. When you look at these referendums, when you look mm. at these votes that are happening in the States and Britain, what should we take out of that in terms of what happens next for our respective countries? Well, it's happening way beyond that. It's happening on the continent now. Look at the, the Italians are voting for the five-star populist party. Increasingly, we see it in Denmark, Sweden, Netherlands, and Germany. Austria. So, in other words, this is not a local phenomena, and I would argue that it's in China as well. And one reason we see Xi Jinping really tightening control over power is because he detects the right. same thing. Do, you just mentioned that in terms of the, the EU votes. Do you think that the European Union will exist in the way that we see it today in a 10, 20, 30 year time span? I, I think we will have a union within Europe, but the direction of travel may change. Right now, they're in a very centralizing, top-down mode of thinking, which... A political the union. Political union. Would which it be more of an economic are... union? What we voted for in 73, perhaps? Or? Well, I think that's what the European voters are more and more asking for, is less top-down political control and more bottom-up mm. economic freedom. I think that's where right. people want to go. Your, your second book, The Leadership Lab, that's coming out in the autumn, but that's looking at the lessons of modern leadership. What, what's the one big lesson that you would draw our attention to in how 
modern leaders behave that's different from the past? Well, it's kind of the next iteration from signals when I said, you know, don't just look through that mathematical lens and dive deep into data. The great leadership tool you're going to need for the 21st century is the ability to look across. It's the ability to think parenthetically, to connect the dots. And instead, in the past, we were so, all very so for, drilled down. So, for example, right, in terms of joining the dots, in terms of how that practically manifests itself, give us, a, give us an example. Well, I think looking at things like, for example, on this question of inflation, uh, and you say, well, the data says there's hardly any. But what do people talk about every single day? As soon as you leave work and you go to the pub, what's the main topic of conversation? I can't believe how expensive fill in the blank is. Yeah, right. OK, so this is listen for this, look for this, instead of assuming. Because your employees, you may say, well, there's no inflation. But in fact, your millennials are barely able to pay the rent. And they may not stay with you because they can't pay the rent. Right. A good signal to cut to the break. Now it's time to just go to that break because this half has been stars and stripes and the big signals of change. Next up is Pippa's take on London and the rise of the machines. So, to borrow the words of the Terminator, I'll be back. Welcome back to The Capital Conversation. My guest today is the advisor and economist, Dr. Pippa Malgren. Now, Pippa, let's move on. The automated future. And we've got an example of a drone, one of your drones right here. HiSight, I believe, uh, is its name. That's right. Is this the future we're looking at? It is absolutely the future. It's an aerial view, and you can manage cities and all sorts of things much more effectively using so, these tools. So you've talked about this as being a tool, not a toy. Yeah. In terms of the sort of things that something like this might do, what, give us an example of, of how this sort of technology is now being used in, in the workplace. So many things. Well, mines, managing toxic runoff from African mines so you prevent environmental disasters. Uh, spotting cracks in dams before they blow. So these are hovering, what, taking images? Every day. Readings? That's right. right. And then it's really about the data management. People think that drones are all about delivery because Amazon once said that's the main thing, but I think that's the least likely use. Mainly it's about data gathering and data so you're an enthusiast about this sort of technology? Oh, without a doubt. Right. I mean, you yeah. said we won't be replaced by, by robots. We will become robots. Is that? Well, I mean, what, that's what is, true. What does Pippa 2.0 look like? Well, <laughs> so. I don't know yet. Well, that's true. We are becoming more robotic. We're going to have more implants. You know, when you need your hip replaced, they will put something in that's going to be broadcasting. And it, it's going to be a whole new world where the dividing line between what is human and what is not will be less and less clear. But I also think it's really important that right. I don't think robotics replace us. They augment us. So we should spend a bit, bit less time watching The Terminator and get yeah, get a bit more optimistic yeah, about what yeah. the, you know, they're not so, going to... This, well, think about it this way. This could be weaponized, this sort of thing, could it? Yeah, yeah, but so an automobile can be, too, but it can still deliver people from A to B. So, but, you know, here's the main thing. We've had 150 years of automation and more and more robotics, and what's the end result? Record level employment virtually everywhere in the mm. world. But it's, but it's only 12 months ago that the governor of the Bank of England, um, Mark Carney, spoke at Liverpool Hope University yeah. and said that there were 15 million British jobs at threat under uh, due to, due to know, automation. Is, 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 here's the bottom does he line. Not know, does, does he not know what he's talking about? Well, look. It, why it he doesn't say, say we should know. <laughs> it, what he doesn't say is here are all the new jobs that will be created that will replace those old jobs. See, that's the main thing. Of course, the economy is constantly destroying all jobs anyway. Will it happen faster with robotics automation? Definitely. But we will also create whole new categories of work that nobody had even heard of before. I mean, there's so many things that Five years ago, who thought marijuana would be a sector in the economy? Well, and Britain well, not is the, here, of course, well, the States, Britain right. is the biggest yeah. exporter of medical marijuana in the world. Right. Britain. So things, OK. All right. so, that, so who so, would have thought of that? So that's one that? thing our kids can be proud of. What Absolutely. <laughs> blockchain, right? And everybody goes, what's blockchain? And we won't explain it now. But the point is, blockchain is its whole category of business now that nobody heard of a decade right. ago. So, so if, you're, if you're preparing for this world, I've got two young yeah. daughters. I mean, I have what, a daughter. what, what are the things that you should be doing as parents or, or potentially a member of this changing workforce for the future. Totally. How can you prepare? Well, number one, I think it's really important to understand that we used to learn French or German or Chinese. They need to learn coding. Coding is a language, and I think that's more and more required. Would, that's would number stop, one. Would you stop sort of formal sort of learning of, say, French or German in No, I just add it. I just add it. it. 
I right. just added. So that's one. Second thing is we have to prepare these kids for a life that involves, well, here, let's put it this way. For you and me, it used to be first we had education, then we had work, and then we retired and had leisure. Our children are going to have all three simultaneously their whole lives. Lifetime education, lifetime working in multiple disciplines, mm. and, and living, lifetime and living leisure, longer, right? and it's living much longer because of all these things. So I think problem solving is more important than rote knowledge. Right. I mean, one of the things you've been scathing about is Silicon Valley and the kind of mystique, I guess, that it has in terms of being almost like this young person's game technology. Well, I mean, is, I, it's not that it's it so scathing. I'm just saying, why is technology considered a young person's game? I mean, the Financial Times came to interview me about my robotics, and they said, we want to do a piece on older women in <laughs> technology. I'm like, what? Because you don't write about older men in business all the time. Really? And the answer is because there's this mindset that only young people can do this. This is crazy. We have a record number of people over the age of 55 re-entering the world workforce. They are the biggest contribution to productivity. And all this is at their disposal as well, because the amount of computing power in your phone, in your pocket, mm -hmm. is more than a defense lab used to have. But I mean, you mentioned the, you know, the FTA after sort of examples of, of yeah. sort of women in, in tech. I mean, we, we need more women in tech, right? We do. In terms of, we need more everybody in and, tech. I mean, even things like STEM education, science, technology education totally. for girls. I mean, how, does, how does tech make its case, or how does it become much more, a much more popular choice well, amongst women, do you think? it's kind of becoming its own thing because of this thing called the maker movement, which is this massive movement that people want to start making things. And it's not just technology. They want to make handbags. They, they want to make toys. They want to make stuff. And so reintroducing that kind of vocational education into the schools so you learn how an engine works and how to weld metal and how electrical wiring works. Make it fun. And that's fun, all right. that stuff. Yeah. Right. I love having an office where we do all that stuff. Well, well, let's move on to more fun. Let's move on to Brexit. Let's move on to <laughs> international trade. Now, I noticed that um, Dr. Fox, our international uh, trade secretary, de described you, I believe, as his political soulmate. Well, what, what, he read that, my book that, and he liked it a lot. Do you take that as a compliment? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I had a lot of politicians read my book and they liked it. I had several prime well, did ministers. Did Jeremy Corbyn send you a, a name no, like that? No, he didn't, but, I have to <laughs> say. But, you know, I had a lot, I've worked my whole life with people in the political world trying to help them understand what's coming in technology and the economy that's going to make ask, things better. Ask, what did he like about the book? What was it what was particularly? What I think he really liked this idea of how innovation happens and that governments have a habit of getting in the way of innovation by putting too much taxation and too much red tape on businesses. Hmm. So that, I mean, that's a theme of the Conservative Party generally. That's a theme that he certainly expressed over right. a long time. You, um, you describe Brexit as a future that's brighter than we realize. Absolutely. Why? Well, the British economy, what drives me mad is this idea the British economy is going to slide into the North Sea and sink. This is insane. It's the fifth biggest economy in the world. It's hugely innovative. It leads in so many areas. It's very strong in manufacturing. It's leading in artificial intelligence, in biotech. It's a global center. So again, I come back to what are the investors saying? They're saying, I'm going to keep putting as much or more capital in the UK as ever before. But, the, but there are not many big voices in business that would echo that sentiment. I that find it interesting. And why? Because they'd rather hang on to rules that are old and they understand than take the opportunity to build a new framework that would be better. Here's the bottom line. The whole world trusts the British to create a rule system that works. I mean, it's you guys who created the Magna Carta. It's only <laughs> it's, the British who lack confidence in their own that, future. Uh, the whole rest of the world is like, so, you know, the so queen saying, on the, so, on so the money the, says... So do I take out of that that it's, it's big business that kind of gets it, understands how big superstructures like the EU works, but maybe the entrepreneurs are a bit more open-minded about this? Or I mean, is that, is that, that the would distinction? Be, that would be my view. Big business likes rules, regulations, and structure because it suits them. They can afford the best lawyers to game the system. But the people who make the economy go are the entrepreneurs because two-thirds of the net new jobs in the United Kingdom and every other industrialized economy are created by firms right. that employ now, less than 50 people. Now, you are... Um, advising the Department for International Trade. Well, right. 
I'm a non-executive non director, right. which okay. means that I'm an independent person and I get to give my opinion, but they don't necessarily follow it. Right. Do they? Do you think you're being listened to? I moment? think, yeah, they are listening to a lot of the things that I say and, and the other non-executives. And it is a big national drive right now to get more UK companies exporting. Are, are there? And, any, you know, and they are. And they are. I mean, British companies are exporting. Here's the bottom line. Yes, okay, we may have more newer trade deals, but whatever the framework is, we can still do more business. But, but does so that bear international... We've got to promote okay, sales. So we're doing better than we were, but when yeah. you look at other countries like Germany and others and you look yeah. at the level of exports that the you know these countries are actually undertaking the UK sort of lags some way behind I mean, how do you close the gap it does and I think there is a role for government to play in supporting the promotion of British businesses internationally and I do think the British are beginning to shift their orientation um, in the past they were very focused on selling to the continent now they're selling to the world mm. and that has to be a better thing because most of the growth in the world economy in the next decade, according to the OECD, is going to come from outside of Europe. Right, okay. Uh, do, you, do you have some sympathy with the fact that just as London feels like an outsider now when it comes to Brexit, and New York might feel like an outsider when it comes to Trump, mm. that these great metropolitan cities suddenly find themselves very much out of steps with the countries that they, that they are situated within? What, what do you take from that in terms of their future? Yeah, and yet political power in cities is not to be underestimated. I would say it's growing. I've also been on the, one of the advisory boards for the mayor here in London. And there's no doubt London is an extraordinary megacity that's growing at an incredible pace. It may be but not in touch. uncomfortable about Brexit. Well, it may not be in touch with the rest of the country, but it is its own organism, which is going to grow with right. or without Brexit anyway. OK, now we're, we're fast running out of time. I just want to turn very, very quickly to your father. I mean, he, he advised four of the big U.S. presidents. I mean, Kennedy, you, you went, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. Okay, and I've worked so, for Reagan and George W. Okay, so, you, so you've worked with two, right? Yeah. So in terms of the advice he would um, give if he was sat here now in terms of making sense of this world, what does the benefit of historical perspective give you when you've been through so much change in the world? Yeah, we talk a lot about this and we'd say geopolitics is back on the landscape. The, the peace dividend is now over and now we have record level defense spending in 2018 breaking every Cold War record. And that's a big issue. So now we have to think what does the next sort of period of tension and confrontation look like? Because it won't look like the last one. And I think mm. here in Britain you've already started so does, to see so a little bit of this. So he looks at tension and confrontation as being potentially... Well, it's a normal part yeah. of the landscape, but we had roughly 30 years where we didn't have to worry about it because of the end of the Soviet Union. But now it's back on the landscape. People are going to be nervous about it, but it's manageable. That's, that's potentially the, the negative side. In terms of what, what maintains your optimism about oh. the future, what could we? What should we end? Bottom line the show is with? just innovation. Truly, we're in an industrial revolution. The the explosion of the invention of new things and new ways of doing things, which is going to radically improve our lives. It's artificial intelligence is going to cure cancer. It's going to fix so many things that we never thought were fixable. An optimistic note to leave it on. Thank you very much, Pippa. Um, and that's all we have time for this week. Thanks to my guest today, Dr. Pippa Malmgren, and what a ride. From inside the White House to our future outside the EU, we heard the case that there are signals we have to learn from. And if the X-Files used to tell us that the truth is out there, Pippa's message is that it might be a lot closer than you think. I'll see you next time for the Capital Conversation.